The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
we should, uh, we should start. So, uh, your, your, excellent, uh, your Excellence, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it is to me an honor today to, uh, to, to introduce the speaker of today's Cyprus, uh, Cyprus Institute Colloquium, Professor Manuel Goyes Pereira, who is at the Institute as a visiting scholar uh, of the System Era Chair H2020 project of the European Union. Professor Collares Pereira is the chairman of the Renewable Energy Chair at the University of Évora and president of the board of the Portuguese Solar Energy Institute. He's also director of the Institute for Research and Advanced Education, which is the doctoral school of the University of Évora. And uh, Professor uh, Collares Pereira is also the coordinator of the National Research Infrastructure solar on Solar Energy Concentration. He has done a very extensive research on solar energy as a specialist in optics and thermodynamics. I have the pleasure of knowing him and been collaborating with him for many years, <laughs> let's say. We have been in, in many projects of the European Union and many other things. And uh, without further ado, I would like just to give the floor to Professor Collares. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. President of the Institute of uh, Cyprus, everybody else in this room, those were the few words I said in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and have this opportunity to speak and explain some uh, aspects of this important topic, which is the contribution of solar for the production of uh, electricity. I'm going to do so by having a small introduction just to position the problem um, and give us an idea of where we are. And, and, and then I will get progressively more technical. But I hope, well, I, I know that there are some people in this room that can understand me uh, without any doubt, but others perhaps, for others perhaps it will be a bit more difficult because it's not your specialty. But if you follow me, I hope in the end something will, uh, will remain. So, sorry. So indeed we have a problem to resolve today, and that's where I will start. And this need to bring fossil fuels out of our economy, and renewables have a role to play, I will make a very quick review of present-day technologies to achieve uh, this uh, objective and then I will be more technical as I said and I will explain that there are some concentrators of solar energy that are linear and that they represent a very good hope for the future um, and then I will explain that even so even though these collectors exist we need new optics to really make extract from them as much as possible I will show some uh, recent uh, proposals and uh, recent designs and then end up this with some final remarks. So let's go to the beginning. So we need to take fossil fuels away from our economy. We need that because of climatic change. Um, and it's not easy because fossil fuels are like a drug. Uh, they are cheap, easy to use. We are very much used to them and how are we going to get them out? Um, it, it's a very complicated problem. But I, I, th there are solutions. And, and um, let me start here. The use of renewable energies. Ah, this uh, pie shows the average for the whole European Union, the distribution of um, final uh, energy forms. Uh, we spend more or less 20% for electricity. Then from country to country, there may be small variations, but it's not very far from this. 31% for transport. And uh, heating and cooling, uh, it's about half of the pie, 49%. So that's, that's the picture. And now what can we do? Of course, we must try to do something for each one, for each, each part of the pie. And uh, for electricity, what can we do? Well, there are several 
uh, renewable energy that can be uh, used uh, to produce electricity. That's hydro, uh, wind, solar, biomass and residues. All of these can contribute to produce uh, non-fossil fuel-based energy, uh, electricity. But then there is something which will help, uh, will happen and will help in the future. And that is the fact that today we predict that electricity consumption we, of electricity use will penetrate more the heating and cooling business. So this, in the future, the, this, the, the slice of the pie will grow. And since now we are producing electricity with renewable energies, we are resolving the problems on this side. The same happens with uh, transportation. We are now talking about electric transportation, electric vehicles. This means that we are going into the transport sector as well with electricity. It's good. And um, here as we have another option, of course, which is to have different fuels, biofuels, which do not have um, the bad uh, reputation and, and practice of uh, carbon-based fuels, solar fuels in the future, hydrogen. So that's another way to bring renewable energies into the transport sector. So on this side of the thing, we as consumers don't have to notice much. As long as uh, suddenly the market is providing us with alternative fuels and with electricity that comes from renewable sources, we are going to be part of, it's already a transformed world. Huh? But what about here? Here, well, of course, we have renewable energies also to uh, provide uh, for the heating and cooling sector. Mainly, in, in terms of renewables, these are solar and biomass. But here, the, the situation is more complicated. We need to bring in other things like energy efficiency, efficiency, demand management. And then also, very important thing, we need to change as well the way we behave. Uh, individually and collectively. And also, in the end, in the limit, what, what we need is a, is a different culture. But it's not, this is not the topic of my, uh, the, the, of my talk. The topic of my talk is there. The, what can we do here? Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But this would be, in itself, another good hour or two of conversation because there's lots of things to, to, to be said about this. All right. So, so what, what, is what is this, this of, of having energy solar energy uh, producing electricity? There, there are, are basically two technologies. One is what we call photovoltaics, and this is uh, based on materials which can transform directly the radiation from the sun into electricity. These are semiconductor materials. Uh, it's a quantum phenomena. The physics that studies this is solid state physics. But all said, they're, they're, today, these things can provide electricity already at very low cost. And they can be done in small systems as well. This is on a roof. Uh, there, uh, th this, is, this is what we call decentralized production. Production of electricity at the scale of our house. Hmm? While before, it's a big uh, power plant injecting energy onto the grid and all our houses will use the electricity, okay? So that's one way. The other way, and that's the one that interests me for, the, for this talk, uh, is what we call solar thermal electricity, STE, and there are different technologies. I'm going to explain to you why this other way is interesting, because I already said that photovoltaics can be very cheap. It is already very cheap, so why am I going to talk about solar thermal electricity? because it has other properties. And, and this is something that I'm going to explain next. So, but before, let me say there are so-called linear concentrators, so big parabolic mirrors like this one that concentrate uh, on, on a tube where I'm going to produce my heat. Um, uh, other, other type of uh, optics, which is called linear Fresnel reflector optics, the mirrors are here and are reflecting through a tube which, which is on top. And then there are uh, a, a different geometry, a rotational symmetric uh, geometry, uh, and all these mirrors are reflecting the solar radiation to the top of the tower, 
and that's what that's where I have my heat. So three different concentrating technologies for the same objective: solar thermal electricity. And how does this operate? So this is a picture of a solar plant in Spain. In fact, two. This is called um, Andasol, one and two. Um, and here are our parabolic troughs along these rows. Um, the fluid that I heat circulates inside the tube. And I have these two tanks there, uh, which can store, store uh, heat. Why is this important? Because uh, I want to have electricity also in, during the night. There is no sun. Okay, so I heat uh, the, 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 the fluid inside these tanks and I can produce my electricity at night. How? All of these plants have the same scheme. Uh, it's easy to understand if, I, if you follow me a little bit. Um, this, the concentrators have a fluid circulating in those tubes, for instance, and I can come here with this heat and produce steam. Steam goes in a turbine, the turbine produces electricity. This is just like a, a, a conventional coal power plant works, exactly this way. Um, but I can also operate this in a different mode. That mode is, rather than producing steam, I have cold, a cold fluid in this tank. I circulate this fluid to another tank, and on the way, I heat it with the soil, with the, with the oil that circulates here. So now I have a hot fluid there, and that's where I'm going to store energy in the form of a hot fluid. So when I need to produce electricity, say at midnight, no sun any, any longer, but they have heat. And I go back with this heat, I circulate the, the oil, produce the steam, uh, and come here. Here I again produce the steam, and the process repeats. So that's the standard scheme for operating these things. So, storing, storing energy, energy is very important because I, uh, there is, uh, uh, from one day to the next, the sun may, may or may not be available, and I have energy consumption, electricity consumption at night. So I need to store energy. So it's a major issue here. And um, you can tell me, well, why, why are you talking about uh, tanks and heat? Why not batteries? We know that there are batteries. And this is a way, a battery is a way to store uh, electricity in electrochemical form. So, but for each unit of energy uh, stored, a kilowatt hour electric, today I need to pay, I said there's a range here of uh, between 300 and 600 euros per kilowatt hour, but we are closer to 600 than, than to 300 really. It's hard to find 300. Um, and uh, we hope that in, in, in a couple of years this cost will come down significantly. But then we have a problem. After a few years of charging and discharging a battery, we need to buy a new battery. So the cost of storing electricity in uh, batteries is high. Okay. What about heat? That, that, that's the other option that I was talking about. Um, well, today it costs between 30 and 50 euros per kilowatt hour electric to store energy in the form of heat. Um, within, within a couple of years, we think that we can bring this cost down. That's what we are working on. And we hope these systems last for very long, maybe 20 years. So what do we have? We have um, a factor of 10 to 20 in cost between storing directly electricity in batteries to storing uh, energy in, in the form of heat. And that's what makes the solar thermal electricity very interesting. It provides, or it comes combined, with a cheap way to store energy. Yeah? So that, 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 this is important to um, uh, remember. Um, of course, uh, electric cars and other uh, things that are under development today will help bring this cost down. But this is a limit, sort of a limit Maybe the limit is 100 euros per kilowatt hour, some people discuss. So unless someone finds a completely new technology with present day technologies, we should be uh, uh, working with this picture. Okay. So, so where are we in terms of uh, producing electricity with the sun? We have photovoltaics, 
without batteries or with very small batteries, the battery in our car, in, in, uh, for our car, for instance, in our house, or a small battery in the house. It's expensive, but we can still afford it. And today, if we, this is competitive with the electricity we pay at, at, at home. So it's very nice, it's low, costs are coming down very much, and also in centralized production, very large plants, um, it is already cheaper to produce with electricity than with conventional uh, energy sources like uh, coal or gas. It, it is very cheap. So that seems to be uh, part of the future already. And then I think we will have solar thermal electricity combined with storage so that we have dispatchable electricity, so that, so that we can have... So this, this is production for during the day, and this is production for when we don't have the sun available. Um, so the, the solar thermal electricity that, uh, and technology that we have today combined with heat for uh, electricity, electricity storage is already a much cheaper solution than PV with batteries. So this is why we do what we do. If this was not the case, if uh, storing heat was not cheap, I would not be here talking about this. I perhaps would be here talking about something else, but not about this. Okay, so what is the challenge? Uh, what do we still have to do? We need to guarantee that we produce uh, low cost electricity. That's already done with PV, but we have to do it with ST, with solar thermal. And so, uh, we have a few ways to go about this. One is to increase the efficiency in converting the solar to, uh, uh, to electricity. The other one is to reduce the number of components, reduce system cost, reduce operation and maintenance, reduce all that. That's a way to bring the cost down. And of course, we need to add storage. Flexibility is very important. And so what can we do? Well, for the, to solve the first, uh, the first point, increase efficiency. Anyone that knows thermodynamics knows that what we have to do is to go up in temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher, the, 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 the higher is the conversion efficiency. Today, technologies operate around 400 Celsius. We would like to go next to 600 Celsius. But why 600, 560? Because above 600, it's a completely new game in terms of material, so that's uh, another story. So this is sort of a limit, uh, which is close to 600, and that's where we want to go. Um, and then we would like to take all of these three te te kinds of uh, technologies that, that I showed and bring their costs down in, in, in many ways. I'm going to talk uh, about linear concentrators and in particular about linear thermal because I think there is the highest potential for cost reduction is exactly here. And I will try to show this, to now prove this to you. So let's uh, take this uh, Andasol field that I showed, a pa parabolic trough field. Troughs have approximately six meters uh, aperture. And, but you see there's an enormous amount of pipes and vents and valves all over the place. We would like to reduce all that, to take uh, that away. So how, uh, how serious is this? Uh, the, the specific case of the undersol is 520,000 square meters of this troughs. And when we calculate what this means in terms of receivers, those tubes, it's 87 kilometers of tube. It's enormous. And um, the volume of the fluid that I have to circulate inside is 19 cubic meters. Um, so if I want to reduce cost, I need to do something about this. Reduce this somehow. Um, so that's one, one objective. The other thing is, what can we do about storage? Because storage is part of the cost. So typically today, people are using um, to store these salts, which are a mixture of um, uh, nitrate and potassium salts. This is called a binary mixture. And it operates uh, in, in, this, in those plants that I showed between 290 and 390 degrees Celsius. So the delta T, the temperature range available to store heat is just 100 degrees. 
And if you calculate what this means, in the end it means that those tanks have 27,000 tons of salt. It's a very big number. And again, you, you would like to think, can I reduce this? Yeah, I want to reduce cost. Yeah. And uh, the answer is, of course, you can say, because otherwise I will, I will not be asking the question. Uh, the, the, the way to go down in cost would be to increase temperature. So if I don't operate at 400 degrees Celsius and operate at 550, the size, the volume of salt I need to store the same amount of heat is two and a half times smaller. Uh -huh. so, I, I, so I have a good reason from the salt side also to go up in temperature. And then I could simplify it further, the whole system, because now I have salts here, cold and hot, why not circulate the salts directly in the collectors? Why do I need all these heat exchanges and that, that oil and the thing? Um, so that's also a way to reduce cost. In principle, less components, less pumps, uh, 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 another f removing one fluid. And again, of course, I produce steam. But because I have this high temperature, I can now have high temperature steam. And feed into a turbine, which is the most efficient turbine available today for this purpose. That's the one used in coal power plants, for instance, with a much higher efficiency. So I simplify. I have less storage volume, and I'm producing electricity with a higher efficiency. Very nice. That's exactly what I want. But what, what do I need now to do? Yes, I need to go for higher concentration. Uh, and that's, and that's what, what I'm going to explain, explain now. But before, uh, let's, let's say, say something about salts themselves. themselves. Then, then I come to optics. optics. But the salts, salts are also uh, to be researched because I need to see if that mixture, binary mixture, can, um, can uh, will give me problems at high temperatures. And indeed they do. So I have more corrosion. Oh, not so nice. I need to see if I can solve this. I have stability of the mixture. Maybe it degrades with temperature and with time. Um, when I do these things, my cost goes up a little bit, so I need to play. Um, and I need to learn how to operate at a much higher temperature, which is not at all an obvious thing to do. So one of the projects that we are uh, working on with several other institutions and companies at the University of Everett is precisely about this. Uh, how, how can we um, have other uh, mixtures, salt mixtures? One concern is that these salts become solid at 223 de uh, degrees Celsius. Could we lower this temperature, for instance? Uh, find other mixtures. Uh, and we can, and we have done this. Ternary mixtures, quaternary mixtures. Uh, let me show you a table with this. This is the binary mixture of today, more or less. It's 60-40, but it's very uh, similar. And, and the, the, the fusion, uh, solidification temperature is 223 degrees Celsius. But by going with, say, uh, calcium, a ternary mixture, we can lower the temperature. And by going with lithium, for instance, uh, uh, lithium salt, we can further, uh, further uh, reduce the temperature. So, just to say, we are working on other salts and other combinations of salts in order to try to resolve some of these uh, temperature problems and low-end temperature problems and other problems like corrosion and so forth. Okay. Another idea is to say, okay, but why do we need to have that volume completely filled with um, salts? Why couldn't we just uh, put some solids inside and then circulate the salts around the, the solids and store energy in, in solids. But what solids? One candidate, an interesting candidate, is wastes from mines. These are wastes, this is a mine in Portugal, you probably know, São Domingos. Uh, this is a copper mine and uh, on the side is an iron mine. Um, and so these are wastes, terrible stuff that was left once the copper and the iron are extracted. So what do you, what do, you do with this? Well, these have, they, they still have some metal content, 
so they have good conductivity. So you, you would perhaps think, okay, let's use this as a solid in my tank and circulate the salts around. This is, this, uh, if I go there uh, with a truck, they give me this for free, of course not. They want to get rid of this. Um, so here is the aspect of these things. But then you cannot just put these powders inside these tanks. You need to make them a salt. And we have studied different uh, cements that will aggregate this. And this becomes like a bigger solid and we put these side by side and inside the tank and that's the idea that perhaps they can, they can operate. But now we must test what do the salts do if the salts degrade these things. And they do. So we have to be careful to find the proper mix. So that's one aspect of research. Another aspect is I showed to you two tanks uh, to store the heat. What about storing it in one tank only? That's called the thermocline. And we also uh, study this. So this is one tank only. Uh, at the bottom, the salt is going to be, uh, everything is, is warm now, it's charged. Here is the salt, here are our solids. Yeah. So we, 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 we start pushing the, 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 the hot salt up and extract the heat, it comes back cold. And uh, so there's only one tank rather than two um, with the solids in the between, okay? And we are also thinking about building these tanks with cement to use other materials that perhaps the whole thing will be cheaper, we don't know. We are developing this, there's quite a number of, uh, quite a number of participants in this European uh, project and it's called the new soul, we are in the middle of it. So I don't have any results to show. But it, it, this is to say that we, all these people, and other groups are pursuing these kinds of uh, ideas. Another idea is to store heat in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in cement, in a salt. So you would circulate the hot fluid in these pipes and the cement becomes hot. That's another way. So we are also studying this. All right, let's go to the concentrators, to optics. So. The objective is to get to 560 degrees Celsius or a little bit higher. How can we do? So we need high concentrations. Why do we need higher concentrations? Because the losses uh, are proportional to the receiver, the, the tube where I circulate my fluid. And concentration is the ratio between the entrance aperture to the receiver area. Aperture area to receiver area. And so the smaller the receiver area, the higher is the C. So we want to put as much energy as possible on, the, on, on that receiver, so we want higher concentrations. And this is a geometric definition. Area of aperture to, uh, to receiver area. In geometrical optics, as I'm going to explain, it's the only definition that matters. All other definitions are flux concentration, other things, don't, care, don't, don't matter at all. All right. I must start by saying that this has already been proposed and achieved for the tower technology. So a plant in Spain called uh, uh, Torresol, uh, Gemma Solar, close to Sevilla, has, exactly this, has done exactly this that I'm talking about. Two tanks. The salt circulating between the cold tank and the hot tank goes to the top. It's heated directly by the sun, and then uh, the, the, the hot salt the, the, the hot salt goes to produce steam in a turbine. That's exactly that. The way this looks is this: you see the mirrors, uh, they see the tower there. You see the two tanks. So uh, this is done for 19 megawatt electric, and it has 15 hours of storage. This plant has operated already many times, many days, 24 hours, continuously, okay? So, it is done, uh, and uh, you can ask me now, uh, so why bother? I mean, you now have a, a technical solution. Well, there is this thing about costs. We want to make sure that we have a, 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 a solution that has the lowest possible cost, and um, also, um, there are many limitations that are associated with tower. It's a very good technology, but there are some, there are some limitations. It's, it's a bit more technical to discuss those, and I'm not, I'm not going to do so. What I'm going to say is there are two other possibilities, the linear concentrators, and we are now uh, thinking of resolving these problems of high concentration 
for these linear concentrators, okay? So, um, but we can already see that we are in the, in the good direction. Why? Because high concentration means a larger effort to size. And so, this in itself, okay, is already a cost reduction thing. Why? Because if you now have a larger aperture for the same surface that is now covered by the undersalt collectors with their six meters, say if you have seven meters, you have less rows for the same power. Less rows already means less tubes, less valves, less bends, less, less everything. So it's, it goes in the good direction. It's very nice. So higher concentration, even before talking about efficiency, uh -huh. thermal efficiency, as I said in the beginning, uh, even before that, it's already giving us less piping, less fluid, less pumping losses, less operation and maintenance. Yeah. So what is the question that I want to ask now and, and then solve? It, it, it is this one. How wide can I make my aperture? Can I just do anything? As large as I want? Obviously not, and, and, but for this I need to be a little bit more technical now. So if you do the mathematics for a parabolic trough, you have a tube, the, the angle that it collects energy is limited or is defined by this ray that is tangent to the tube. It's the last one that the system can collect, okay? And when you do the mathematics, you come with this formula. Concentration is the, the definition, the correct definition in geometrical optics is Aperture divided by the perimeter. And this gives this, one over sine theta, theta is that angle there, multiplied by sine of phi, phi is the uh, opening angle, okay, and divided by pi. So when you take the tube, the, the, there's practically only one tube on the market with 17 millimeter diameter inside, um, then you do, the, you do the mathematics. Theta is typically chosen to be two and a half, two and a half. Uh, width of the sun, sun width, and the concentration comes to be 27. Uh, and the, the entrance aperture is about six meters. So that's given by this formula. And that's all the parabolic troughs on the market that are on these plants have this, uh, more or less these dimensions and are designed more or less this way. Okay. Now, uh, I'm Yes, so, so let's, let's, let me, the next, or this slide is perhaps the only slide with the mathematics, but it's very simple. In geometrical optics, we want to talk about the quantity, which is known by the, its French uh, word, étendue. And what is that? It, it's going to look at first sight, uh, Senor Ambassador, as very complicated, but it's not. Just bear with me, okay? Um, let's, um, the definition is the following. It's a product with two terms. One is, say that you have a, a surface here, dA, and radiation is coming through. Huh? You have radiation coming through. Um, and it goes with an angle, theta, to, the, to, to, the, to dA. So the product of dA times the cosine of this angle is this surface here. It's the, the perpendicular to the incoming radiation, this surface. And then this, this, this the, the general direction of the radiation is this theta, but it can have a cone of dispersion. I mean, the, the light is around this angle theta is dispersed by a factor uh, d omega. So if I multiply this angle by this surface, I get a quantity, and this quantity is called etonic. It's pure geometry. Imagine rays going through that, um, and what this tells you is mathematically how, ma how many rays you have. Okay. With this kind of uh, definition, uh, you, you accommodate two things that are important in optics. You accommodate the, the, the space, you, well, you accommodate the space that is being uh, uh, tra traversed, traversed by the radiation and the angle it makes. Okay, so uh, let's look at, a, at, a, at, a, at an example. Um, you have three flashlights here. These three flashlights are shining light on the, 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 the aperture to a box, AD. Yeah? 
and they make an angle. The light that comes out of these identical flashlights in there makes an angle alpha. That's our omega. So the étendue of this would be A times alpha. Yes. Now, a good optical device is one that will not uh, lose étendue. We say it conserves étendue. So what is the, the, a good optical device here? Well, this one. The same flashlight, if it's the same flashlight, it's the same étendue, exactly the same. But now I'm shining on an entrance aperture of the box, which is smaller. Uh, but the étendue is the same, so what changes is the angle is now larger. So the product is still the same, space times angle, uh, but uh, the situation is different from that one. But we say that this box in this situation conserves étendue. See, if it conserves étendue, its efficiency is maximum. Very nice. That's what, it, what we want to do. So we want to treat any optics according to this conservation of étendue rule. And that's how we will find the limit. So we can ask a question, which is the following. If we have an, an entrance aperture and an angle for the radiation coming in, what is the smallest aperture that we can put? Because remember, A divided by B is concentration. B, uh, this, this B is the smallest possible, therefore, my concentration is the highest possible. And what is the answer? Uh, of course, we need to conserve it on you. Do the mathematics, I'm not going to bother you with that. What is the result? It's this. A divided by B is one over sine of that angle. One over sine theta. theta. And why, why is it non image We call this any optics. We don't know what to put there yet. Huh? But any optics we place there that does this, we say it's non imaging optics. Why? Because imaging is associated with the angle, with the, the information. Image, the image is something that reproduces an object. Huh? So the image is the information that we have of the object. So in this case, angle to translates the fact that we have a, a, a information. And what happens here is that when we get to this limit, the rays get out in every direction. So this information is lost. So imaging is lost. Uh, and this is why this is called non-imaging optics. Okay. So no, from now on, it's going to be easier to understand everything. So now let's look at the parabola. The parabola, uh, as this concentration, C, 1 over sine theta times this. But C max, the maximum concentration, would be just 1 over sine theta. So what this means that the parabola is an imaging focusing device and is very far away, oops, sorry, I don't want to do that yet, and is very far away, a factor of pi, away from the maximum possible. So all of these focusing uh, solutions that we see including the towers, by the way, are of the focusing type, are not the non-imaging type, and are very far from the limits. All right. So what did, did some people uh, try to do? Some people on the market have come up with what they call, the, uh, in this case, they call it the ultimate trough. So they made this aperture, they went from six meters to eight meters. Now you know what's going to happen. Theta, the angle, must be smaller. Must be. So, well, it is so much smaller, in fact, that it is very hard to manufacture these parabolas. To, ma to manufacture this precisely and install this precisely, it's very hard. So, but this is the limit. You cannot go past this. It, 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 if, if you do a larger parabola, theta is going to be just the sun, and it, uh, anything will get you out of the focus, and it's a disaster. So, the question is we can do better but we must use another kind of optics. And what is that kind of another kind of optics? That is something that we put uh, around the tube. We, we say, we talk about second stage concentration. So we take the initial focusing optics and we transform it with what we know um, is possible and it's called second stage concentrator. So another concentrator around the tube. And then, of course, the, it's more complicated because this is no longer a parabola. We modify everything, but it doesn't matter. 
So in fact, this one, this, this, this solution has a name, it's called SMS, Simultaneous Multiple Surface. Uh, it, it means that all these surfaces are optimized together. And uh, now let's look at the comparison. I can design for, the same, for, for, for a conventional parabola with the six meters and the uh, acceptance angle, which is the typical one of uh, three suns, it's not here, doesn't matter. I can design then an SMS with the second stage. And, and look at what happens. Concentration now is the double. Concentration is the double. The angle is the same. And the size of the parabola is 11 meters. Of course, the tube is the same. I, I, I concentrate the double. Rather than 6 meters, I have 11 meters. No one is going to build a parabola with 11 meters, although this is very nice and high concentration thing. But it's completely not practical. So. This, this is, is not, not the way, way to go. go. Uh, and so what can we do? Ah, luckily there is Fresnel technology. Ah, what is Fresnel technology? Fresnel technology, as we heard today from Alaric, uh, explaining the, 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 the birth of, of Fresnel technology, uh, is, can be explained in a parabola this way. Uh, here is the conventional uh, a parabola. Uh, uh, with a tube, and this typically has the six meters that we talked about. But what if I approximate? I approximate the parabola by flat mirrors, that portion, that portion, and put that all on the ground. And now each mirror tracks the sun to the focus. Now, who is to tell me that I cannot have a parabola with 20 meters or 30 meters? No one. So now I have a way to produce very high concentration uh, collectors uh, without, having, uh, without having to go beyond what the conventional parabolas can give me. Okay, so this way of doing is uh, called Fresnel technology. That's an example of Fresnel technology. This one uh, from Germany, uh, the original PSE at Fraunhofer. So now I have these mirrors on the ground and I have my um, tube uh, at the top. Okay, so that's Fresnel technology. Now, the same is happening with conventional Fresnel I mean, this is just a parabola, right? With a focus there. So it's not yet non-imaging. It, it's not yet in the limits, okay? And so how bad is it? it, it it's, it's also going to be bad. So the, the, real, the, the difference between the concentration I can get and the maximum concentration for a flat is 0 0.45 and for a tube is the same 0 0.31. So I need to do something if I want to take advantage of non-imaging optics. And how can I do this? Well, mm, if I asked you, you probably could tell me right away, you need to conserve it on view. You make, must make sure that you conserve it on view and then you must make sure that you uh, bring the concentration to a higher value. So that's the recipe. Um, so it is obvious now that this device here does not conserve it on you. What is it on you? It's only coming from the sun, all this radiation with this angle two theta. It's being reflected by mirrors and it goes back to a point there somewhere, the focus. Uh, and, and you see that some light doesn't get there. And some light that would come from here will be blocked, so shading and blocking. So, so I lose it on view. So this is not a good idea if I want to go to the limits. Um, so it only is not conserved. So there's a large room for improvement. And then someone, that this, this, uh, I, I mentioned him because he was very important here, uh, David Mills from Australia, he said, ah, that, uh, why only look at one receiver? Why can't I look at two receivers, for instance, and think that my mirror my mirror here could either send radiation there or here, and uh, therefore um, I would conserve it only. So this improves it on the conservation, and it's a nice concept. And it's called multiple receiver or, com or com uh, compact receiver. Uh, okay, but it, yet, it, yet this solution does not use second stage optics. All right, so let's go a step further. So a company called Novatech a while ago said, ah, we need to concentrate more, we can concentrate more, and so we use this non-imaging optics approach. So they, they developed a, se a second stage concentrator to concentrate the solar radiation onto the tube. And so they gave a step in the right direction. 
but they were not yet conserving it en nu in the way they, it should be conserved. So it's not yet the final answer. So what is the final answer? Final answer could be a multiple receiver solution. Uh, it must nearly match it on you. It must approach maximum concentration with a proper second stage. And this is how we started thinking about this. Uh, and one of the ideas we had to start with, so we have two receivers, and we said, well, why should we uh, put the mirrors on the ground? Why can't we put the mirrors on a curve that helps this thing about shading and blocking? Of course, the scale there is not correct. It looks more like this. And indeed, this is, it does well for the Etondu stuff. Um, and then we, so our first design was something that looks like this. So we were concentrating 66 times. So it's an enormous difference from the 26 that the parallels can do. We were really designing for this high temperature. We were placing this at a height of seven meters. We were uh, the, having a total width here of 30 meters um, and an asymmetric solution. So one receiver there getting light from here, other receiver there getting light from here. Yeah, so this, this works. How do we know it works? Because we can do what people in optics know as a ray tracing. And uh, red is good, blue are some losses. Uh, but its performance is very nice. But it's a drawing, we never build this. Um, because we were using uh, non-evacuated tubes and there are no non-evacuated tubes for this high temperature. So this solution is a nice solution, but could not be materialized. So, then we said, okay, we can do an SMS. I already showed this to you for parabolas. We can do an SMS. And we, and we could indeed obtain a, a, a concentration of 74 times, um, and here a primary of 20 meters. Yeah, very nice. So this thing has no losses, uh, and, and it's a perfect match to the tube, and this is a, 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 the angle is even larger than usual to his sons, so it's very nice. So this works. Then we thought and thought and thought more about this, uh, there are some uh, problems. This thing is very big. The final solution turns out to be the second stage is very large. So I said, oh, we want to do something more practical. And then we went to a multiple receiver solution, asymmetric. But now rather than having one tube there and one tube here, we put them on the same tower. Ah. So this portion of the optics is looking this way. That portion of the optics is looking that way. And uh, the total uh, width is like 24 meters. Uh, the details of this, I'm not going to explain too much, but here is our evacuated tube, and there are different uh, optical curves combined to produce the right result. Very nice. Um, and this should, uh, this should do the thing. And this, then we found a company, uh, the one that uh, Fabio is, uh, representing Fabio Montanino and his, and his friends, and they, they, they are fabricating Fresnel collectors, and they heard me, and they are willing to build something like this. Very nice. Very happy with that. And so we will have a prototype in uh, Evora, uh, I hope soon, uh, with this technology and demonstrate it. Because I have in Evora, as I'm going to show, I have everything else. Um, oh, this is just the details on uh, the concentration and the final aspect. There's a very nice feature about this idea, and that the fact that we, since we have two tubes, we can uh, have a field formed with rows, formed with rows uh, that can be very long, but we can circulate the fluid one way and on one tube and bring it back on the other tube. So there's much less pipes, much less. Remember, that was the objective in the beginning. We want to reduce everything else. This does that as well. So that's my experimental facility in Evora. Here are the two tanks, okay? Uh, and all of this is the thermodynamic, uh, all, all the conversion uh, uh, components to convert heat uh, from the hot tank uh, into steam. Um, and what we have already there are a parabolic trough 
um, system, which uh, is going to be connected directly to this. And uh, this will, so this is a consortium of different companies. In this case, most of them are German. Yara is a German Norwegian company, is a salt company. So we are not just uh, studying the connecting these two things, the, the collectors to the tanks. We are studying new salts and new components here on the thermodynamic uh, side. So it's a very nice project. The idea then is to produce 540 degrees steam at 100 bar. That's what we want to, we hope to demonstrate. And there, exactly there, where there is nothing now, is going to go our Fresnel. So this is a picture. And what is nice about this is that then we can test side by side a concentrator which is the state of the art today, with the Fresnel technology using the same infrastructure. So this is an aspect, an, another aspect of the parabolic field today. It's completed now. We are, we are, we're now connecting the, uh, the pipe with the pipes, this to that. And this is a view from the other side. Um, the land around is the, the uh, agricultural department of the University of Edinburgh. So we do have some sheep and some uh, animals going by and they keep the ground clean. It's nice, this, this, this thing works. Um, and we also have a testing platform for solar concentrators, and we hope to assemble here a, a small part of the Fresnel module and test this in a more complete way. So this platform uh, rotates and tilts, so it tracks the sun, tracks the sun, uh, and, and it can allow for detailed testing of solar concentrators, which is an interesting thing to do for the industry and a difficult job to do. And we have here a loop which circulates oil. Uh, hot oil uh, to cold oil uh, to the concentrator, it's heated, gets back and back to the loop. So it's the same thing but with oil for testing. So in conclusion, um, so renewables uh, can give a substantial contribution to decarb our economy and in particular in, uh, for electricity production. And I think, I'm quite convinced, and I hope I show this to you, that no imaging optics and with advanced LFR has a very fair shot at low-cost dispatchal of electricity. So high concentration enhances efficiency, lower thermal losses, um, and uh, conversion efficiency as well. But it gives us this as, uh, as a bonus, small number of rows, less fluid, less parasitic power consumption, and something very nice as well. In the Fresnel, the receiver is fixed. In the parabola, everything moves. That creates problems, so mechanical problems. But not with the Fresnel. With the Fresnel, we, we have a fixed receiver. And that simplifies things very much. And in the future, we hope to study many other possible configurations. Go on increasing the concentration. Uh, put the mirrors on the Euton dimension curve. Try different uh, configurations, mirror widths and things like that. So research, there's lots of research here uh, possible. Um, and um, this is why it's interesting to do systems, other systems like this one in other places. And we have been thinking about doing one in Cyprus maybe um, with this, for these very high concentrations because we can try different aspects of the technology here and uh, prove that it works as according to what I've been explaining. And I thank you for your attention. I think I completed, yeah, I completed my 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
First, let, let me say that there are, uh, reason, there are other reasons besides cost to go with linear concentration. And that is the, that in my view, uh, if you want to do very large solar plants, after a certain power capacity, for instance, say 100 megawatts, the, in, in a tower technology, the last meter is very far away. And so it's difficult to, perhaps it's difficult to do larger plants. And with linear technology, you can do 100 megawatts, 200, 300. I mean, so you could think of larger plants, um, uh, and that may be an advantage. Okay, so, but in many situations, you would go with 100 megawatts. It's perfect. The power of tower technology is much better. Um, the other thing is that um, when you think about uh, Fresnel technology versus tower technology, it's very similar. It's also heliostat-based technology. Uh, mo the movement of the mirrors, it's a very simple thing. And, but these are, are flat or nearly flat mirrors and the cost at which you can produce this is, is uh, in, in great quantity. It is going to be low and as low, I would say at least as low, if not lower, than heliostats. So maybe in the end the cost, uh, but, but it's not now. Now it's going to be very expensive. Uh, when, I, when I talk to these guys, they ask me uh, fortune. Uh, but that's for this prototype. Um, uh, in, in the future, I, I think. Uh, we have made some calculations. Um, as you know, uh, tower technology and parabolic drop technology is being proposed today in the world uh, for LCOEs around, uh, already around 7 cents a kilowatt hour. So I made some calculations uh, with the, the, as much information as I could get from those plants that are already being proposed, because a turbine is a turbine. Molten salt of molten salt, etc. And uh, assuming a cost for uh, the mirrors, up, uh, installed cost for the collectors, above the $100 uh, uh, per square meter, which is the target for towers, so I assume anywhere between eight, uh, 100 uh, euros and uh, 150 euros. That's a, that's a low cost, that's a goal to achieve. Uh, then I could produced today without effects of scale with, 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 with today's technology uh, I could produce in the south of Spain and Portugal uh, electricity with an LCOE of 7 cents so I would be ah, between 7 and 8 cents okay so quite competitive without taking into account things that I don't know how to take into account and those are the, all the other savings that I mentioned less components less piping because I'm taking a bulk number for pipes bulk number for for, for components. So, so this, this mm, as, a, as a potential to go further down, and so be competitive. Now, I'm at least comparable. Uh, whether it's going to be cheaper, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I mean, it has to be built, it has to be operated, it has to be, it has to prove that it w works this way, and then you, 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 let, you, you need to let the scaling factor operate, work, and really further reduce down. And I think you can perhaps scale down more with this than, uh, than, with, uh, than with towers. But because when you build a plant, and if you, if you want to design 200 megawatts or 300 megawatts, um, uh, the, the turbine is, is the same, for instance. Uh, and so, so th there are many reasons for this to be larger plants to produce lower cost electricity. But all of that is to be, to be proven. So I, uh, there are then special configurations and special ideas, like the ones that you're exploring, uh, heating the salt directly, things like this, which may in the future have an interest in, in, in further build, uh, bringing down the cost. But that's research. We, 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 that's why we work. That's why we uh, are happy people uh, pursuing our dreams uh, <laughs> and trying to see uh, what we can, where we can get to. Uh, at least I have the feeling that what we are proposing leads to reasonable numbers. That's all I can tell you.
Yes, so there are many opportunities. For, for say, the, 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 the non-imaging optics uh, is um, allowing us to build something like that with three suns, with, with the width of three suns, rather than two suns there. I mean, this is doing 2.2 suns. The precision here is, 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 is incredible. They are now very much worried about the alignment of the tube and every, everything must be perfect, because otherwise they will lose radiation. They will not get as much as they get. And we don't care. I mean, we, we have a large angle. We know that we can put it there more or less. The second stage optics will take care of all uh, imperfections. Uh, but I know this, and I'm sure about that, but other people don't. I mean, we have to prove it. We, we have to really do it and, and show that it can be done uh, in a reasonable way, in a cheap way. And then, and, and, and also the nice thing is that here, once we put the Fresnel on the side there and, and, and we circulate the same salt, the same day, and obtain the same data, okay, uh, the, 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 it's very nice because we are comparing, we will be comparing directly with the very best Fresnel in the world. This guy just produced, TSK Flat 4, uh, it's the very best Fresnel that exists, uh, at least that I know. Uh, and and um, it is a fantastic piece of, of, of uh, precision, precision engineering, it's absolutely incredible. And it will be very nice to see that we can get the same efficiency as theirs, or even higher. So that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the thing. And, and I, I, I mean, and I, I take the challenge. I mean, I'm not afraid. I, I think I will do it. <laughs> well, uh, before we go on. I'm going to also do, uh, take the opportunity and close the microphone to show us something. One thing is, I think that the, the well, first, the technology that right now is uh, the established technology uh, uh, in terms of capacity installed is uh, parabolic trough, and I think this is a very good competition with parabolic, with parabolic trough for all the reasons that you have said. Parabolic trough and this technology has uh, the advantage uh, of the modularity and, the, and also the in places where the attenuation can be important you don't have the problem with attenuation. So there may be, may be in places where you will be more competitive than the other, even if you are at the same time or a little yeah. lower, that, that would be, I think this is a, another thing. In, uh, we are also going into, uh, as I told you, multi-towers and all these things, mm -hmm. the inventing the Fresnel in the other direction from the tower technology, yeah. and that could be also an interesting, an interesting competition and, and, this, and, this, and this kind of thing. I think that's interesting to have a lot of solutions still that have to be proved and at the end will be the industry to determine will. I think another interesting thing that is important in the cost, when you consider cost, is the possibility of standardization. And some technologies are better than others in this, in this way. One of the reasons that you are talking about will be one tube, not only one tube, there are a lot of providers of tubes, as you, as you all know, is that because at the beginning we established uh, in, uh, well, in some international collaboration, the Eurotrop, and we disseminated that when we started the, the thing in Spain, the, 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 the market, then everybody is building the same tube, and this has uh, the advantage of standardization. So I think that's all, all what I want to say. Yes, that, that very true. Let, let me just show it here. I, I plan to, once we, 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 we uh, get through with the Fresnel, yeah, we will show that it works. I want to work on how, because I, I, I think now that there are some advantages as well. You are switching to the conversion <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, so and, and why and how? I mean, uh, this I don't think it's very practical because this mirror is too far. That's what he was mentioning, attenuation and so on. But smaller towers, several, and, and perhaps beaming down the, 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 the radiation to the ground and directly storing the heat on, on top. I mean, this is another uh, possibility. That's the kind of thing that you are looking for. So it's fine, it's fine. But uh, I think you are uh, with this kind of solution, these kinds of things are as far from the market or even, or even further from the market than uh, Fresnel. Because there are pre commercial Fresnels on the market already. We are just changing that a little bit and making them a little bit better. So we can perhaps claim being closer to a market solution than these uh, beam down small tower kind of, kind of solution. But I don't see, I mean, I am not at all uh, against that. On the contrary, I want to work on that as well. Uh, because I see uh, opportunities Opportunities to use these non-imaging optics, because uh, again, here in these towers, in conventional towers, they are conventional in, in terms of optics. Uh, and so they, 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 they 
also stand to gain when you use more cards. Uh, but uh, as we said, I used to have a point I know it's one of the truths that there are only one means of explanation. Mm -hmm. Right? Which one are you referring to? Our own. Ah, yes. Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's, uh, it goes, it, it's already in the direction of a non It's a non means of explanation. It is. Uh, does not get out of the limitations associated with bringing things onto a focus. But uh, it can be easily converted, can be easily converted into a true and unending of the explanation. Yes. More, more questions? We have also people online. I don't know if you don't even know if there are any questions from people who come in online. Yes, yes, all right. Yes. Well. <laughs> the, the, the limitations are not, well, with linear concentrators, concentrating a few, well, 50 or 60, best, uh, you can achieve higher temperatures, but it's already pushing uh, the, 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 what you can do. But the, the, re the re real limitation is not with the optics itself. The limitation is with the materials that you need to have to, to, to operate above 600. 600 is like a sort of a barrier. Up to 600 you can still go with uh, steels, more or less special steels and, and things that are more or less available and you can do it. Above 600 you need to, it, it's a different story. Uh, you need, you need a completely a different materials to operate with, uh, to construct these things. So the tube, for instance, would have to be quite different. Uh, if it's not a tube, it's a cavity, it's a bit quite different. You have to use these uh, ceramics uh, and, and other ideas. So it's a completely different game. Um, but indeed, there are some people thinking about going to higher temperatures. Uh, then they would have to use other fluids, uh, liquid metals, for instance, or air air and solids. Um, th this is possible. So there are solutions, but they are, co th they are very far from commercial. For these applications, not at all. Perhaps uh, for production of special materials, production of fuels. Um, yes, so, 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 but it's, we, we are talking about a, a, to a totally different uh, story. Um, some people in the past were proposing uh, uh, using air as the, as the heat transfer fluid and operate above a thousand degrees Celsius um, directly feeding into gas turbines, for instance. Okay, that's feasible, it's possible. But then it, why, why wasn't it done? Uh, because this required really a completely different engineering of the whole system. And, 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 and therefore, uh, you have to do too much. To, so, Today, people are thinking of solar fuels, uh, we dealt with these, are thinking of uh, uh, chemical energy storage, chemical reaction that you split the two, uh, two chemicals and, and when you combine them back, you have the, the heat back, other things um, that make perfect sense because you can only do them at those temperatures, fine. But um, I would say that for electricity production on, on this scale, I think uh, what we have, either with the towers or with the linear concentrators is coming close to what we can do in terms of practical things on a large scale in the field. At least for a while. And I think we so need to, to, to finish uh, now. Thank you very much. <laughs>